So uh, welcome to Grand Rounds, everybody. It's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Brian Schurz, who's an assistant professor in the Department of Laboratory Medicine. A little background on him. So he has a bachelor's degree from the University of Utah, and then went on to get an MD, PhD degree from the University of Pittsburgh with an emphasis on human genetics. Then returned to the University of Utah and completed a residency in pathology, including a chief residency here followed by a fellowship with an emphasis on molecular genetics. We are fortunate to then have him join the faculty here at the University of Washington. He's currently the Associate Director of the Genetics and Solid Tumor Division of the Department of Latin Medicine. In addition, he's also an Assistant Director for the Informatics Division. He's actively involved in teaching, including directing the Department of Laboratory Medicine Grand Rounds course and lecturing at both the undergraduate and postgraduate levels. He's actively mentoring several students, residents, and fellows in research. He speaks locally, nationally, and internationally about his work, and at the national level is the chair in the Clinical Sequencing Exploratory Research Consortium. His uh, research is well-funded with several grants. He has numerous published articles that focus on integrating complex genetics into clinical care. This includes research on the storage and communication of genetic information in the healthcare setting. He's here to, today to enlighten us with his talk, Are We Approaching Clinically Meaningful Genomics? Recent Developments in Clinical Genetic Testing and Reporting in the Electronic Health Record. Please help me welcome Dr. Brian Schurz. Well, thank you for that introduction. Inter introduction and thank you for having me here. It's, it's a pleasure to speak to you. Um, the introduction was mostly correct and I'll correct the rest of it during the talk. So, um, so first disclosures, um, I'm an employee of the University of Washington Department of Laboratory Medicine. I feel very um, honored, to, uh, privileged to be part of a wonderful group in the Department of Laboratory Medicine. Um, I did some consulting early in 2015 which I no longer do and is not relevant to this talk. But the most important disclosure is I'm part of a team, and everything I talk about here is the, the, the work of many, many people. Um, so I want to start out with a, a, a case. Um, this is a case of um, a um, hereditary cancer. Uh, most of what I talk about today will be hereditary cancer, but many of the principles apply to many different diagnostic tests in medicine. Um, I'll speak about cancer mostly because um, that's um, what I focus on um, in, in my clinical diagnostic work. This is a 40-year-old woman. She had a family history of colorectal cancer, and so started having um, colonoscopies early. At her first colonoscopy at age 35, they identified five adenomas. Um, a subsequent colonoscopy at 39, they um, could not count the number of adenomas that there were in the colon. Um, biopsies uh, confirmed they were tubular adenomas. Her mother had colon cancer at 54. She had a cousin with colon cancer. Um, and so the presumptive diagnosis, diagnosis is familial adenomas polyposis or some other related disease that would lead to um, more polyps than um, you can count. A sample was sent to the University of Washington Department of Laboratory Medicine for the ColaSeq test, and the diagnostic results was um, we found a single exon 10 inverge, complex inversion. Um, and uh, with um, mRNA studies in Mary Claire King's lab, they were able to show that and, um, Sylvia Cassidy was able to show that the, um, this inversion indeed caused skipping of exon 10, which was consistent with the clinical findings. Uh, so the conclusion was that this patient had a diagnosis that was confirmed um, with a specific genetic cause. Um, this patient has over a 90% lifetime risk of colorectal cancer. Um, she can plan preventative surgery, start discussing this with her physicians, and um, importantly, relatives can be contacted for targeted testing. And so that they can get appropriate screening and um, prevent uh, uh, the, the eventual cancer that may, may occur in um, anyone who carries that um, very specific, very complex inversion. The reason why this is an interesting case um, to me, and, and I'll explain, the reason why this is an interesting case to me is, is it's something that um, we would not have been able to identify um, five years ago. Um, none of the standard testing would have identified this 
single complex conversion. Um, and yet we were able to identify it with what is now um, the standard of care for testing for hereditary cancer. Um, so I'll talk a little bit about why we're interested in genomics. Um, I'll spend a large amount of time talking, asking, is next generation sequencing ready for clinical medicine? I and mean, I'll talk about specific aspects of next generation sequencing in the context of clinical care. And I'll talk about is clinical medicine ready for genomic information? Um, and these really are different questions. And I'll talk about rare family specific variants. And can we handle those in the electronic health record now? Um, and then about um, how we can incorporate broader genomic information into the electronic medical record. So, why genomics? Um, the answer to that really is that there have been amazing advances in sequencing today. Um, this is something hopefully everyone in this room has already heard about. Um, but just for an overview of what next generation sequencing is, um, it's massively parallel sequencing. Sanger sequencing um, was the standard sequencing uh, method, DNA sequencing methodology for several decades, and it was based on amplifying one specific strand of DNA and sequencing that one specific amplified strand of DNA. And there's many methods for next generation sequencing, but the commonality between all of these methods is that they take, instead of just one strand, they take many, many, many strands, millions and millions of strands usually, and sequence them all at once and image them all at once. And so it's, it's, a, um, it, it, it's, it's a, a process to do basically what we've done before and do it a whole lot all at once. Um, there's many more technical aspects of that that this talk isn't going to get into. So once you have all these sequences, we align them to a reference genome. Um, much of next generation sequencing now, much of, of sequencing methodologies is based on the fact that we have a reference genome. The human genome was mapped, and what we do now is take sequences and align it to a, a map that we already know about. So the fact that next generation sequencing is entering clinical care shouldn't be surprising to us, because this is a pattern that's happened over and over again. This is a slide that uh, my colleague Colin Pritchard uh, let me use, but we, we, we did um, chromosomal banding, and that turned into the field of cytogenetics a decade later. Um, we, PCR was developed in the early 80s, and by the 90s, we were doing PCR in the clinic. Um, every major breakthrough in technology that could potentially be clinically useful five to 10 years after it's discovered or developed is moved into the, into the clinic. So it shouldn't be surprising to us that as next generation sequencing became commercially available in 2005, now um, we are using it in clinical care. So, is it ready for clinical medicine? Um, before I get further into the talk, I want to make something very, very clear. Clinical next, gener next generation sequencing is different than research next generation sequencing in many ways. Um, for one, in research next generation sequencing, usually researchers are looking for the most data they can possibly get at the lowest price. Um, so usually coverage is between eightfold and thirtyfold. There's some research projects that go that go for higher depth sequencing, but clinical next generation sequencing uniformly has much much higher coverage. Um, usually, oftentimes next generation sequencing, I mean, on the research perspective, is focused on specific variants. Um, one of my colleagues that I, I, I trained with during my doctoral training is entirely focused on translocations. And all of his research is focused on developing the right methods to find translocations using next generation sequencing. Well, with clinical care, we could do that, but usually a clinician is asking a specific diagnostic question, not a specific technical question. And the diagnostic question, if, if a gene is to be disrupted, it can be disrupted in many ways. So we design clinical assays to be able to detect many, many different types of variants. And that's not necessarily true in research sequencing. Um, most oftentimes, research focuses on exomes or genomes because the questions are broad questions. Um, in clinical next generation sequencing right now, um, the tests that are being ordered, the tests that um, are in the market right now are usually targeted panels for, for specific diseases. Like I said, I'll be talking about um, hereditary cancer testing, but there are panels for hypertrophic cardiomyopathy and other cardiomyopathies. There are panels for um, epilepsy. There are panels for immunodeficiency. There are panels 
And but all of these are panels that are targeted usually at a specific disease where there's many genes that have overlapping traits. Um, for research, if someone writes a grant, they say, they'll say, we can do this. And then once they get the research money, they'll perform the experiment and write up a paper to say, this is what the quality of the testing, this is what the quality of results we have are. So performance characteristics are usually determined retrospectively, where in clinical sequencing, we determine the performance characteristics prospectively. We get hundreds of samples or dozens of samples. Um, we get known positives and known negatives. We run them through the assay and we say, can we detect what we say we can detect? Um, and are we getting false positives or not? So the analytic performance of clinical next ray sequencing has greater than 90% specificity, greater than 90% specificity. Um, the interpretation is also different. We interpret clinical text in the context, clinical um, diagnostic testing in the context of a specific patient, um, a specific scenario, and we oftentimes consult with the ordering physicians to um, address specific um, needs or specific concerns about a specific patient's presentation, and we report it in that clinical context, and that usually is not true for research. Um, so I'm going to dive into this even more to, to, to hammer, this, um, hammer these points home. So when we evaluate a diagnostic test, we look at the analytic validity, we look at the clinical validity, which is different than anal analytic validity, we look at the clinical utility, and we also look at the cost effectiveness. Um, and so I'll talk about specifically panel next generation sequencing um, as it addresses each of these. So analytic validity. Um, can next generation sequencing detect um, the types of mutations we're looking for? Um, the, the exciting thing and also the challenging thing about next generation sequencing is that we're trying to detect multiple types of variants. And there are multiple specific tests that were designed to detect these in the past. For single nucleotide polymorphisms, there are various methods. Um, Sanger sequencing could be used, and also various methods to detect specific um, changes that, that are important for clinical care. Um, small insertions and deletions, um, same methods are used to detect those. Um, large deletions, duplications, microarray, FISH, um, MLPA. Um, th these are methods that are used specifically to detect large deletions and duplications, structural arrangements, cytogenetics, um, and fish assays are designed to develop these. Next generation sequencing can detect all of these, and I'll go through examples of each of these. Um, some of them, it takes an appropriate sequencing strategy. It takes a strategy that's designed to detect um, potentially specific translocations or specific deletions and duplications. Um, so um, this is, uh, th these are the results from the validation assay for the Polsky um, um, assay that we perform here at the, at the University of Washington. This is work by Colin Pritchard. Um, you know, can we detect single nucleotide variants? Yes, once we get up to 40 or 50 fold coverage, then there's almost 100% um, sensitivity. And also once we get up to, to high coverage for insertions and deletions, there's very, very high reliability. Um, so this is a, a question that still comes up occasionally, and people will say, well, if you detect something with next generation sequencing, do you have to validate it? Do you have to confirm it with another traditional assay? Um, and, I, and I love this paper. It came out just this summer. It's something that we've known here for several years, um, and that this is the first publication that's really, really, you know, empathetically said, no, we don't. Um, when we, they, they looked at 919 comparisons between next generation sequencing and Sanger sequencing, there was 100% concordance and their conclusion was confirmatory analysis by Sanger sequencing is unnecessarily redundant. Um, right now what we're seeing, more, if, if we try to confirm things with Sanger sequencing, what we're finding is that, that, well, Sanger sequencing really is the gold standard if the primers have been validated for the specific sequence that's being sequenced. Um, and there's only a very small segment of the human genome where there are Sanger primers that have been really well, robustly validated. Um, and so next generation sequencing, we validated really across a much larger genomic area. And so oftentimes what we will do is we'll find something, develop a new Sanger assay to see if we can validate the same thing. And then for some reason, that Sanger assay wasn't well developed or wasn't well validated. We won't find something in Sanger sequencing. We'll have to play around with it to, to detect what we could find in next generation sequencing. So the bottom line is next generation sequencing um, is the gold standard now. Um, not any next generation sequencing, clinically validated, high coverage next generation sequencing is the gold standard. So deletion duplication analysis, 
Um, by counting read depth and normalizing read depth, we can detect um, deletions and duplications very robustly. And so here's, here's a, a deletion of the first six exons in NSH2, um, which would be a, a mutation that would lead to Lynch syndrome. And this is one of the most common Lynch syndrome um, variants that's a mutation that's present in the American population. Um, so let's see, we've gone through deletions and duplications. And for structural rearrangements, the first slide that I showed you um, illustrated that we can find structural arrangements um, using next generation, next generation sequencing. A single exon inversion is probably about the most complicated or challenging type of structural, re structural rearrangement um, that, that could be detected. So, yeah, so, so I want to move on to a second case that shows, again, the power of clinical next generation sequencing. Um, this is a case um, that happened early on. Um, it came to my colleague, Colin Pritchard. A woman had a clinical diagnosis of Cowden syndrome. She had features that were consistent with Cowden syndrome. Um, the gene that's responsible for Cowden syndrome is P10. Um, she had P10 full gene sequencing and deletion duplication analysis, and it was negative. They couldn't find any mutations in the P10 gene, even though she had clinical features that were entirely consistent with the mutation in the P10 gene. Um, Goal seek was ordered, and, um, and we identified this uh, small deletion um, in P10 of two base pairs. It was only present in 21 out of 1,184 sequences. So that's about 1.7%. On Sanger sequencing, if we would have known it was there, we could have detected it right here. You can see that the, the two base pair deletion causes this shift. And then this is the, this is the, the sequence with the deletion here. Um, if anybody here has looked at Sanger sequencing traces before, um, this looks like background. Um, th this is not something that someone would have a high suspicion of being real. Um, so, so anybody would have missed this in, in Sanger sequencing. Um, but in next generation sequencing, it becomes very, very clear. In sequencing other tissues of this patient, we found that in non-blood tissue, and there was a higher, free, higher percentage of this. And this, this patient it, it has what we call mosaic mutation, something a, a post-zygotic um, mutational event um, caused this P10 mutation to be present in many of her cells, but not all of her cells. Um, so in next generation sequencing, yes, with appropriate strategy, we can detect these mosaic mutations. And is there another method to detect these? Not really. Um, there really are no traditional, no, no, there's no traditional way to detect these mutations. But this is an example of, of, of something else that, that is just amazing about um, this new technology, is that we are able to identify things that we were able, never able to identify before. We have higher sens sensitivity than we, were able, than we had before. Um, and so this is really pushing the field of clinical diagnosis and the field of clinical medicine forward when we're able to identify mutations we haven't identified before. Um, so analytic validity is strong for next generation sequencing. Um, and now let's talk about clinical validity and clinical utility. Um, Mary Claire King last month showed this slide, and I have to bring it up again because this is really a seminal study. Um, the, um, Tom Walsh, Mary Claire King, Liz Swisher looked at ovarian cancer and in patients with ovarian cancer, this is, this is um, not selected for, um, for family history, but just in general patients with, with ovarian cancer, they found that the genes that we know cause high risk of ovarian cancer, BRCA1 and BRCA2, are present in about two-thirds of the patients. Then between a quarter and a third of the patients have um, pathogenic mutations, deleterious mutations in genes that are in the same pathways as BRCA1 and BRCA2. And um, the, for diagnostic testing, this means that if we just test for BRCA1 and BRCA2, we're missing a whole lot of people that could benefit and a whole lot of families that could benefit from understanding the mutation. So there, there is a one disease to many gene correlation. And next generation sequencing allows sequencing of many genes all at once, as opposed to a sequential analysis of multiple genes. And I'll talk about that a little bit more. Um, this paper came out actually just last month as well. It was an analysis of the Cancer Genome Atlas projects of uh, multiple tumors looking for the same thing. What genes are, are truncated, what genes are mutated. And what this shows is, is what I really want to show. So here's, here's the genes that they looked at, a higher prevalence of, of truncating mutations in. And here's a series of types of cancer. The list is over here, and I'm not going to read through them all. Um, we have breast cancer, we have 
um, ovarian cancer, and many other cancers, endometrial cancer. And what you see is a many-to-many -many relationship. There are many genes that cause increased risk of many different types of cancer. So with a many-to-many -many relationship, um, now that we understand this relationship, what is the appropriate diagnostic testing strategy for a many-to-many -many relationship? Um, so what we see is that there's, um, it, when we look at hereditary cancer, and I'm going to show several studies, this study found a 43% increase in actual findings with panel testing as opposed to um, just looking at BRCA1 and BRCA2 for hereditary breast and ovarian cancer. Um, this study looked at um, breast and ovarian cancer and also colorectal cancer. They found um, actual findings in an additional 11% of, of, of ovarian cancer patients when they looked at genes other than BRCA1 and BRCA2. They found actual findings in many genes. Um, when they looked at colorectal cancer, regardless of the selection criteria they used, if they used a selection criteria for a number of polyps, or if they used a selection criteria for early onset, no matter which selection criteria they used, they found many genes that were responsible for colorectal cancer. Um, and so they couldn't find a selection criteria that was specific for just one specific gene. There were, there were always many genes associated with it. Um, and, and then this, this study um, simply found that with a single-tier approach or, or panel testing at first rather than multi-tier or one test and then another test and another test, they, they found um, that they just had a higher mutation detection rate. So, um, so, so there's a clinical argument to be made for testing multiple genes at once rather than the traditional method of just testing one gene at a time. Um, the third question is this cost effective. And I want to show, show a case um, to, to illustrate the cost effectiveness in LS. Um, the 35-year-old 35 35 woman with 20 um, chronic adenomas. Her father died of colorectal cancer at 55. But right now, my differential diagnosis is actually quite broad. Uh, she could have Lynch syndrome. She could have attenuated familial adenomatous polyposis. She could have other, another polyposis syndrome. Um, and so what's the optimal testing strategy? Um, just to illustrate, this is a summary of the genes and syndromes that are associated with um, with colorectal cancer. The only one that I can kind of rule out potentially is this familial adenomatous polyposis because you should have potentially more um, polyps, but the same gene, different mutations in a different place, different places in the same gene, the, the APC gene, um, have this the same picture. So she could have um, mutations in many, many of these genes, or, or she could have um, something else. And in clinical testing, um, even with very stringent selection, cri selection criteria for um, early onset or for family history, we still only get 20 to 25% success rate in these families. So she could have a mutation in any one of these genes that's responsible for her for polyposis syndrome, or she could have something, she, she could, it could, it could have be nothing at all, um, or at least nothing genetic um, that, that we can identify. Um, so this would be the approach that would be taken um, several years ago. This is not the approach that we've taken now, but this is the approach that we've taken several years ago. So you'd have um, the most likely genes tested first. Um, it's very likely they'd be negative. You go on to the next step of the next most likely genes with specific mutations that that, that first level of testing missed that would most likely be negative. Uh, we would move on to the next set of genes, and the next set of genes would also like to be negative. Potentially, each of these steps would require another return to the medical genetics clinic or another blood draw to, to send off these tests. And the cost would, would incrementally increase with, with all of this. Um, so right now, the approach would be to order one test to get a result and, and hopefully be done. Um, so the next question, the, the question of cost effectiveness was addressed most um, um, most clearly by Carlos Gallego, well, he was here, he's no longer here, um, and David Veenstra and, and many others, um, when they asked specifically, is panel testing for um, colorectal cancer, is it cost effective? And a formal cost effectiveness analysis showed that at a, um, while at $100,000 per quality adjusted life year, then there's about a 99% chance that this type of testing is cost effective. With cost effectiveness analysis, you toss in a whole bunch of assumptions and then try to determine if what the assumptions you're saying is, is really true. And, and it, even it's, it's you know, potentially, um, it, 
the quality adjusted life years is fifty thousand dollars, it has a seventy five percent chance of, of, of being cost effective. So this is pretty remarkable, and um, compared to cancer treatment, this is extraordinarily cost effective. So I hope I've shown that in the specific case of panel testing for targeted treatment, then um, next generation sequencing is valid, it's clinically useful, and it's cost effective. Um, when we expand to genomes, then that question, these questions haven't been answered. Um, uh, genomes really aren't done at the high coverage that we do for um, targeted panels. And when we talk about genomes, we talk about m many, many more and broader questions. Um, and so, so we're still working on genomes. And, and, and right now, at least in laboratory medicine, we don't do um, exome and genome testing. There are cases where exome and genome testing may be called for. Um, and I know they do a lot more exome testing at the Children's Hospital here, um, where there are specific cases where it looks like there's an unidentified genetic um, cause of, of a specific pediatric phenotype. Um, so our next question, is clinical medicine ready for genomic information? And here I talk about genomic information. I'll be talking about exome information, genome information, and also about this broader information we're getting from panel testing as well. Um, so again, panel testing is available for, for many, many different types of diseases. Um, genome and exome testing is also available. Um, and um, but, but like I said, it, it's, it's, there, there's a different set of, of reasons to do genome and exome testing. So one of the questions, I've talked about all the benefits of it. The, the, now I'm going to talk about the downsides. Of, of, of large-scale genetic testing. Um, and one of them is what I term family-specific variants. Um, others may call these unique variants or rare variants, but from experience, most of these are not unique variants. Most of these are not variants that are only present in one patient. They're variants that are present in a family. And actually, if a variant is unique to a specific patient, if it's de novo in that patient, then actually that tells us a whole lot about the variant just from knowing it happened in that patient with a specific phenotype that might not be shared with their parents. So those ones are actually not as challenging. The challenging ones are variants that are only present in a family, that potentially happened in our human history 100 years ago, 200 years ago, or 500 years ago. And so in a small or large family, these, these variants are present, but we don't see them in population databases. Um, we don't see them necessarily um, in, in research studies because they've been done in different places or, or ascertained in different ways. So to explain why family-specific spe variants can be challenging, um, you know, every individual in this room is unique. Every individual in this room has variants that are specific to them and specific to their family. Um, and every single point mutation that is possible in the 3 billion base pair human genome is, if it's compatible with life, it's probably somewhere on the planet today. So as we sequence, we find these rare variants. And sometimes they're associated with the phenotype we're looking at, and sometimes they're not. Um, so um, on this graph, we have kind of the, the, the level of the amount of sequence we're getting, um, up to 3 times 10 to the ninth, which would be a full genome. And here we have the percent of maximum information. So in the green line, we have actual information. In the red line, we have incidental information. And so as we sequence more and more, our actual information goes up, and also our incidental information goes up. Um, so what we want is we want the most actual information and the smallest amount of incidental information. If I change the scale here on the y-axis, you can see why this can be a, a, a problem. That instead of percent of total, I'm having the average number of variants per patient. And this is not, this is not um, you know, many, many variants, we can say, very easily uh, are extraordinarily unlikely to have any clinical cause. So th 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 these are included in the graph. Um, so, you know, maybe there's 20 or 30 clinically actionable variants in any specific genome, in your genome or my genome. Um, but each of us has millions and millions of rare variants. And so as we get to larger scale sequencing, the number of incidental findings goes up. And again, most of these we know are, are, are completely benign findings, but some of these we have to address. Um, so in this graph, I, I looked at about um, 
about a dozen published papers of diagnostic testing. And what I looked for was the, the, the actionable findings and the variance of uncertain significance that they're reporting. So variance of uncertain significance are rare variants that are um, that, that, that may be suspicious for the, the, for the disease in question, in this case for, for hereditary cancer syndromes, um, but which are, haven't been reported before or for which there's conflicting information. And as the number of genes goes up, the number of variants and certain significance reported per case tends to go up. This, this could be, um, on research studies, I've seen this as high as, you know, five to ten variants of uncertain significance per case. But in clinical research, we, we, we tend to have a, a higher threshold for what we, what we want to consider as a, as a uh, variant, and we tend to scrutinize the variants more. So there's lots of different laboratories that test for hereditary cancer. And what we want is, what, what the green lines show is the, the um, diagnostic success rate. The, amount of pathogenic variants that are responsible for the, for the, the clinical history um, or, or that could be causing a, a risk of cancer that, that are one. And this goes up a little bit with the number of genes that are studied, but um, it looks like for most laboratories the variant, number of variants of uncertain significance goes up as well. Now this area is, is not a good area to be, and this area it is, is the good area to be. We want more um, truly pathogenic variants and fewer rare variants of uncertain significance that we can't explain. Um, and um, so if you're looking at this, you can say, well, why do we order larger tests? And I've already showed, if we add more genes that could be, that, that could explain it, we, we have more diagnostic power, even though that goes up a smaller amount as we get to large genes. Um, and one question that, that, that I didn't answer when I practiced this, but somebody said I had to answer was, why is the University of Washington Department of Laboratory Medicine way down here? Um, and um, we're, we just had a paper accepted to genetics and medicine which describes this, um, but the short answer is a lot of hard work by a lot of smart people who have a lot of experience. Um, and the short answer is we, we look at the variants very carefully and each consider them, each of them individually, and bring all of the experience, published literature, knowledge of databases, knowledge of the domains of specific genes into play when we look at this variance, these variants. Um, in the, the la just, there, it's difficult to say published, but the, the laboratories that are on, tend to be on the higher end of the spectrum tend to use more automated algorithms. Um, they, there are always molecular genetic pathologists that, that review this information. Um, and they're always experts to review the information. But the, the higher reliance on automated algorithms tends to generate more variance than certain significance. Um, so the other reason is that the other reason, the other way, thing that we can do to address these variance than certain significance is try to solve these. Um, these are not necessarily a challenge, but an opportunity to learn more about the pathogenesis of disease, to learn more about genetics, learn more about genetic function. So this is an example of a, of a case that we saw. This is a 45-year-old man with colorectal cancer. Um, the tumor showed microsatellite instability. The tumor had loss of MLH1 and PMS2. And so this looks like a patient that could have Lynch syndrome. Um, but about half the cases where the, the, this happens, um, it's not Lynch syndrome, but there's, there's somatic mutations that are, that are causing this phenotype. Um, so, um, so, so this could have Lynch syndrome, but, but it might not. Um, when we sequenced the individual, we found this specific MLH1 variant. It's, it's not an exonic exo variant. It's about plus five of one of the exons. So it's not even at one of the canonical splice, um, um, the, the, the two base pairs plus or minus that are really known to really influence splice sites. Um, it's classified as a variant of uncertain significance. And the, the computer tools we use to calculate whether this variant might affect the splice site or not were kind of ambiguous. They gave different answers. And so we weren't sure, could this affect splicing or not? Um, in order to solve this, um, we got the family. We asked the genetic counselor if there were other individuals in the family who might be willing to be tested. And she found this cousin who had the same phenotype, loss of MLH1 and PMS2. She tested this cousin and uh, I think the, the father as well. And did some statistical calculations with the help of Elizabeth Rosenthal in medical genetics and found that this variant 
um, had an adjusted log factor of 1.4 or a base factor of 25, which means there's a 25 to, to 1 um, likelihood that this variant really is associated with this Lynch syndrome phenotype that, that, that we're familiar with. And then subsequent studies, again, from Mary Claire King's lab, showed that this variant really did alter splicing of MSH2, and we can classify this as pathogenic. Um, we've never seen it before. We saw it for the first time in this patient, and um, within a year, we're able to say, this is definitively pathogenic. We can report this in the public databases, and anybody else who sees this, again, will know that this is pathogenic. So uh, this is something that there's, there's dozens, there's, there's tens of thousands of variants of uncertain significance that have been reported to patients now. And very few of them have been able to trace the variants through their families. And very few of them have, have been able to de determine if they're pathogenic or not. So one of the areas of my research, and this is a, a website that, that we put together, is to explain to patients that um, they have the power to find how their variant follows through their family. Almost every, la every laboratory that tests, that does genetic um, panels for hereditary cancer risk um, will follow up a variant of uncertain significance and test family members for free if there's enough information in that family to be able to classify the variant. It doesn't make sense to test a whole bunch of family members for free if we're not going to be able to classify the variant. And the limiting factor is the size of the family. Um, and even if you're an only child, you have cousins, you have second cousins. And actually, the siblings aren't very informative. It's the second cousins and third cousins that, that become extraordinarily informative, and the cousins that become very informative for um, being able to classify these very, very insensitive significance. So um, patient education can help, it, and we're, we're moving forward to try to, to inform patients about genomics. So lastly, I promised I'd talk about the electronic medical record. Um, so is clinical med medicine ready for, the, for genomic information? Um, is it ready to get all this information in the electronic medical record? Um, and um, I've done a little bit of work with this. I'm, I'm chair of the, not the Caesar Consortium, but of the Electronic Health Record <coughs> Working Group in the Caesar Consortium. That was the one thing I had to correct from the introduction. Um, so I focused a little bit uh, on the electronic medical record and how information is conveyed there. When we think about moving genomic information into the electronic health record, um, we talk about personalized medicine. And um, th there, there's been a huge amount of debate and discussion here, um, some of which is informed by reality. Um, this, this is what we, we think of when we think of personalized medicine oftentimes. Um, we think of 23andMe or we think of, of studies where we can say, well, I can get my whole genome, I can look at the genome-wide association studies um, uh, uh, for the common variants that I have, and I can say, what's my risk of obesity or prostate cancer or hypertrophic cardiomyopathy or, or myocardial infarction or um, any of these um, common diseases? And once I know that risk, then maybe I can do something that I wouldn't do otherwise. Maybe I can actually exercise when I'm not exercising now. Or maybe I can eat healthier. Um, and there's been some studies to show that having this information does push people one way or the other way. Um, but there hasn't been a study yet that's shown that this works better than what we already do, telling people to eat right and exercise more and to do the preventative um, medicine that they should, should be doing. So uh, on the other hand, some of the genomic information that really is important um, isn't found, it wouldn't be found by looking at common variation. Um, this family-specific variation is, is very important. These variants that are, that are specific to you and your dozen or hundred of relatives that have that same rare variant that you have, um, at least in cancer, those are the variants that, that are really important. Um, so th this is uh, from one of the other studies that, that I actually showed previously. When they looked at the number of patients, I, I love this graph because it's so simple. If you sequence more patients, you find more unique variants. And the curve bends very, very slowly. The more people we sequence, the more unique variants we find. How are we going to handle those variants in the electronic medical record? Um, this is what we want to hear from our physicians when we hear about personalized medicine. Because we know about your unique genetic variation, we can tailor our treatment to you and avoid 
know, awful, harmful side effects that you would otherwise have. This is what we could also hear from our physicians. Because we know about your unique variants, we know that we've never tried what we're going to try in someone just like you. Um, this is always true. Um, every time this is true. Um, and this is, the, this is the reverse side of the coin with personalized medicine. You know, if we get personalized down to the individual, then every patient is an experiment. Um, and so randomized, there's been a, a huge push in medicine over the last century for randomized controlled trials. Because with randomized controlled trials, we, we don't know whether it's going to work in that specific patient or not. We know if we treat a whole lot of people, on average, the effects are going to be good. Um, and personalized medicine is, is, is moving a little bit away from that in, in some ways. Um, and, and in some ways, it's just saying we're getting smaller subsets of the population. But when we really move to personalized medicine, we really move to, to, to the, the area where genomics can inform um, our decisions in meaningful ways, then we have to start wrangling with what do we do with these very specific variants that we may have never seen before, maybe specific to that family. Um, so can the electronic health record, or the electronic medical record, help? Um, I, I love this definition um, from the Centers of Medicaid and Medicare Services because it's so clear. The electronic medical record is a digital version of a traditional paper-based medical record. Um, and when you look to the push from the, the CMS to, to do um, electronic medical records, it was a push to avoid the mistakes of transcription handwriting of moving and the, the, the difficulty of moving large pieces of sheaves of paper from one place to another place. And the electronic medical record actually helps with this a whole lot. Um, when was the last time you couldn't read someone's typing in the electronic medical record? Now, this, this is, this is a, 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 a strong advance. But now that we have things digitized, we're asking more questions. We're asking, really, can the computers that are running our electronic health record can they do more than just present typing clearly? Um, and uh, and, and this, this is a difficult question where there are lots of challenges. Um, I, I, I'm going to show a series of, of desiderata papers. Um, the first one was, was by Dan Macy and, and several others talking about the technical desiderata for integration of genomic data into electronic health records. And there were several more after this because desiderata is just such a fun word. To say, um, and, and it means kind of what we want and, and what, what's the ideal state. So um, there's technical desiderata for integration of genomic data with clinical decision support. Clinical decision support is saying the computer can give me a suggestion about what I should do with this patient. And when we think about rare genetic variation, decision support is great. You know, if there's a test that's been done 10 years ago, how am I supposed to know about that? You know, it would be wonderful for a computer to tell me, this test that was done 10 years ago has something important for you to know about that, that will, should inform your decision for, for pharmacogenetics, let's say. Um, and then also, desiderata for representations of phenotype algorithms. So, so there's, each of these desiderata, I'm going to distill for you in just a few sentences, has, um, says we need to have our information in computable, um, systematic representations, and so that they can be both human-readable and machine-readable. And it needs to be rep this information needs to be represented on multiple levels, and so that um, a physician doesn't have to go through an encyclopedia of the genome to find out exactly what's going on, but that they can be in this information can be indexed in ways that, that a machine can read and a machine can interpret and present to, to a physician. So, how are we in getting there? So this is the work of the, the, uh, both the CSER and the Emerge Consortium. These are two large consortiums with large academic centers um, across the country um, that are at the forefront of pushing genomic medicine forward. And we surveyed these, these institutions to say, what's the current state of the representation of genetic information at your institution? And, and these are the results. And what we found was that almost everyone represents genetic different types of genetic information as PDFs still, um, which is probably the least computable form of information there is. Um, the next most common way for everything except pharmacogenetics um, is text blobs, which means the same thing as PDF, but just a, a, a chunk of text that's been put into a field in the computer and that usually needs natural language processing to be able to pull any computable information out of that. Um, 
And very few are reporting multiple variants from one test, which is what we, we would hope for genome scale testing. Um, to be able for panel testing, actually reporting one variant, we very very rarely see more than one variant, and, and it's extraordinarily rare to see more than two variants um, that are associated with, with with some of these diseases that, that where we do panel testing for. But for genomic testing, we need multiple variants, and very few um, institutions are reporting multiple, and very few institutions, um, but more and more institutions are reporting defined results with this, defined tests with discrete results. But it's still something that, except in pharmacogenetics, um, is, is the minority. Of institutions, um, so we're working towards this, um, and as a, as a community, we're working towards this because we've realized this is something we need to work towards, not on an institutional level or a single research level. We need to work towards as a as a community, and these consortiums, like the the Caesar Consortium, are really critical for um, for, for getting institutions together to move this forward. This is another collaboration um, that I've been uh, involved with a little bit. The, the displaying integrated genetic information in EHR is the digitize action collaborative sponsored by the Institute of Medicine. And they said we don't just need academic institutions, we need the EHR vendors on board, and we need um, diagnostic laboratories on board, and we need to get together with everyone and define how we need, we, we should define the workflow for um, decision support rules. This is one example from, they, they chose the simplest pharmacogenetics rules to tackle first. And this is a schema for what they had to consider to implement, um, to, uh, to, uh, implement to design an implementation guide for the simplest um, <coughs> clinical decision support rule. So it's a little bit complicated. Um, and you can see how much, how much work goes into making a simple genomic clinical decision support rule. Um, and we'll need hundreds of these in order to do um, precision medicine on a genomic level. Um, we're working towards there. Um, but it's not cheap. Um, Patrick Mathias, who's sitting in the back there, and Peter Tracy Hornick and I worked, worked on this, where we said, well, we, we've designed clinical decision support for the, um, for the CSER um, consortium, uh, the CSER patients that are working through Gail Jarvik's project. Um, and, and those patients, if they have, uh, 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 if, if they're prescribed a drug by any of you, where they have uh, change for a genomic um, where there is a pharmacogenetic decision that would influence that decision, um, you will receive a pop-up. Um, none of you receive pop up so far. I know that because I get a pop-up too. I, I get an email when you receive a pop-up. Um, so, so we've put this in place for these patients to show that it can happen and show that it works. And we've showed very effectively that it works in what we're doing with potentially benefit of patients. But these events are rare. And so in order to make it really cost-effective, we need to do it on a much, much larger scale than we're doing it. And that much, much larger scale has to be larger than just our institution. It has to have multiple institutions collaborating. Until we get to that point, where we are now, you know, the sequencing may be $500, which is just the reagent costs. The data analysis may be $1,000, which is actually a, a kind of low ball for, for what's happening in, in, in real clinical exome and genome sequencing. But the clinical decision support um, is many times that. And one of the reasons for that is um, in order to do clinical decision support well, um, in order to do it on a genome scale well, you have to maintain it for decades. And our um, systems, our computer systems, our electronic health records and our laboratory information systems that feed into these electronic health records change every five years, and it takes effort to update those. When we, Patrick and I did this analysis, we found that the, implementa the upfront implementation cost was less than a fifth of the total cost that it would take to maintain those computer systems um, over 30 or 40 years to wait for a few people to have this pop up. And, um, and so, so that's something to consider, is that when we design these systems, we need to design them to last a long period of time. So um, I hope I've showed that, that next generation sequencing is very rapidly replacing older methods for genetic testing. Um, targeted panels have been shown to be efficient, sensitive, specific, and at least in the case of colorectal cancer, and probably for many other diseases, cost-effective. Um, and there are many limitations to broader genetics. One of them is family-specific variants. Another is that um, it takes a lot of work to incorporate a lot of complex information and present it in a meaningful way in electronic health records. And um, there are, like I said, there are many, many people involved in this, many people in the Department of Laboratory Medicine, um, many collaborators, in, um, in the Division of Medical Genetics here, 
um, in biophysical humanities, biomedical informatics, um, any consortiums that that I, that I um, that, that are involved in this as well. Um, and so, thank you very much. We have time for questions. There's one here, there's a and there's one there. So a question I have is often we're reporting or variants right now are reported as either significant, clinically significant, or not significant, but many of the tests other tests outside of genomics were reported in a range with a reference range, and there's sort of a, a second layer of interpretation that goes on at the physician level with the clinical picture putting together the test results. Do you see sort of a, perhaps some sort of a risk scale or something like that for variants that integrate some level from what the, you know, the pathologist and the, the clinical geneticist sees um, that lets the physician then put together, you know, a second sort of risk assessment? Yeah. So, so the guidelines right now actually do have somewhat of a scale where there's pathogenic, likely pathogenic, variant of uncertain significance, likely benign and benign. Um, for our, our reporting here, we don't report benign and likely benign variants because they, they're just a distraction. Um, so there is a scale. The, the, a reference range is usually used for a quantitative measure. Um, so then the question is, so why, why don't we give reference ranges for genetic variants. Well, the reference range is the reference human genome. We do give the reference range. When, there's a, when you see a variant G to A, the reference range is G. The, the unusual is A. Um, and um, so, 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 so the, the, the reference range concept is, is a little bit odd. But I think what you may be getting at is, um, why don't we prov do we provide more of the rationale for why we're considering these variants to be pathogenic or not? Um, in our reports, we try to provide that rationale. We try to provide references. In most laboratories, we also try to provide uh, uh, quite a bit of information about that rationale and behind those references. Um, oftentimes, we don't get into technical details. Um, and, and some of that's we're trying to figure out what the right language is for the right audience. We know patients will be reading these. Um, and we know that physicians that don't have genetic expertise will be reading these. Um, and, and we love feedback. We love feedback from clinicians who read our reports. And most laboratories actually appreciate feedback to say, you know, we could use more information than you're giving about a specific variant, or you're giving too much information and you're confusing our patients about a specific variant. Um, so, so, yeah, I, I appreciate that, I mean, that comment a lot. And um, this, this is something we're, we're still trying to figure out, is, is how much information to give and how much information is, is um, distracting. There's another question. Um, great talk. Uh, Tom Payne. Uh, one of the other areas where EEHRs could help uh, beyond what you're addressing today is that we represent the pedigrees in the family history in a very um, poor way, in my opinion. Yeah. And there is, you know, we have 1.6 million visits a year in our system. And if we were able to better understand um, the, you know, a priori risk for heritable disease in a person, and we could do that if we had that pedigree information in a more computable way, it might it might mean taking better advantage of the tools of the sort of what you're discussing today. Yeah. yeah so the comment is, um, if we had better representations of family history and pedigrees in the electronic health record, that would that would dramatically improve the way we how well we could do genetic testing. Um, and I would say, amen, absolutely. You know, we, we we need to do family history better if we want to do genomic medicine better. Yes. I think one of the challenges, and are people thinking about this, for disorders where has cancer or doesn't, um, it seems like it's a the information that correlates with the genetic information. But uh, probably equally important is And second, are groups thinking about how do you go back, or even our institution? I have no sense in a year how many variants of undetermined significance become known pathogenic or known benign. And how are we going to kind of always take a look back and say, oh, the person that had their sequencing done 
a year ago. And quantitatively, do we have any sense of how much of a problem that really is? I mean, how dynamic is the yeah. information? Yeah. So, so the first question is, how do we better represent phenotypes in the electronic health record? And I'm just going to refer to this paper here, because I'm not going to be able to address all of that and, and all the points, but, but this is the reference. And um, they, they talk about that extensively and very well. Um, the second question was, um, yes, when genetic inf when a variant classifies a variant of certain significance or, or, or potentially something else, and the, the classification changes. Um, so, so Heidi um, Rehm has, at, at Partners in Boston, has worked extensively on that and published papers on that. But, and, and it's something that, that every laboratory handles a little bit differently. Um, from our experience, we've reclassified probably 25 or 30 percent of the variance of uncertain significance we've reported. Most of those have been classified as likely benign. A handful of them classified as likely pathogenic. Um, and, um, and what happens oftentimes is the patient comes to the genetics provider and says, hey, you know, it's been a few years. Do you have any more information? And the genetics provider contacts us, and we, and we report back to them. Um, and oftentimes when that happens, we revisit them and say, no, there's no information. Um, we revisit our information periodically. And I say periodically. Initially, when we did validated the test, we said we're going to do it every year. And then we found we were revisiting the information more often than every year based on um, new information that came out, that, 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 that has been coming out. Um, and, and perhaps when information, the information flow slows down, we'll do it every year. Um, but we, we try to systematically go through the variants, and we try to um, send reclassification reports when we can. Um, there's different electronic ways to, 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 um, to automate this that are being piloted. Um, and it's not really clear what, what the, the clinical standard's going to be. So I, I think there's a lot, of, a lot going on in that area. So the question is, how do you affect cost effectiveness? So, um, so I'm not a cost effectiveness person. Um, but the, the, how do we affect, to, to, determine cost, to determine cost effectiveness of actually of the, the panel, hereditary panel testing, um, most of the benefit, of, the benefit actually comes from being able to prevent um, cancer in family members of patients who have been identified with pathogenic variants. Um, and you know, if, if assessing cost effectiveness, you, from what I understand, you put in a whole bunch of assumptions about trying to get close to what the reality is of what the costs of testing are and what all of the benefits of testing are, and then try to calculate those out all out um, in the different scenarios. It's, it's, I, I would refer to, to the cost effects analysis that I quoted David Veenstra. I don't see him in the room. I would talk to David Veenstra. Other, others in cost effectiveness can describe better than I can those methods. 